Hey guys. Um. Well, I wanted. Uh, this is my first vlog in a while. Tales of Night here. Uh, he actually got cut off mid recording last time, so. I think I'm just gonna pick up from the beginning. Um. I guess you could say this is a tough time of year for a lot of people. You know, friends, family, co workers. Mentally, financially, emotionally, spiritually, even physically for some. And everybody's, you know, got their doubts and their demons. A lot of people, their anxiety starts climbing. Their depression kind of sinks a little more. And it gets worse and worse and worse for everyone. And... I think I'm here to tell you my story. And my story, well, I was getting pretty into detail before this cut off, but the seed started in elementary. I had really bad anxiety. I had apparently rampant ADHD and seizures, and I'd black out, I'd destroy classrooms, and kids found out they could trigger that, so they'd trigger it further, and I tried to be, like, a good kid, like, there's, like, this cute little crush that I had once I got over my first crush, who apparently just liked me for my dog, and this is, like, first, second grade, I think, and she would always, I think her name was Brittany, I can't remember, I told my dad she was, like, my first Chinese girlfriend or something, I don't know, my dad could recite a lot of this to you, <clears throat> she would always drop her pencil box, and I'd do, like, the stud thing and pick it up, you know? And I was always like that with kids, you know, if somebody needed help, I'd try to help them with something, if they wanted, you know, an answer or something, if I knew it, I'd try to help them, if they just dropped their stuff and fumbled, I'd try to help them. I was genuinely a really, really, really good kid. And then, that small division starts happening, you know, we know it's socially something's different about you. There's not a wall yet, but there's like a little stump. You have to get up that other kids just like, huh, smooth about. And then you start noticing all the other kids like, but you're still over here. They're over here and you're like in the distance. And then when they found out that I had really bad anxiety, which apparently would trip a mental breakdown further into a blackout moment where I made decimate places. From apparently flipping chairs, throwing computers at people. I don't know how I managed that in, I think, fifth grade, fourth grade, but apparently I threw a computer at a girl. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I threw it in her general direction, not at her, but who am I to judge perspective, truth, it's a matter of perspective. This way might be someone's this way, and I might for that that way, or... I don't know, but I, I'm not trying to justify it. I shouldn't even be trying to argue that right now. That's straying from the point. I think it's because I'm, like, avoiding the bigger stuff. But I have to get there. We all have to get there eventually. Um, And then it slowly got worse and worse, you know? And I moved, and eventually, no matter where you go, people find out. You know? You stare at the ground. You don't look at people directly in the eye. They say something, and then you trip, and... The tide goes out, and then you feel the tide pull at your feet, and eventually the whole tsunami comes crashing down on you, and then next thing you know, you're stranded on a beach, staring off into the distance because you have no idea the wreckage behind you, and if you turn around, you'll know exactly what that wave of emotion ensued, and... Numerous times, I just recall being told I picked my nose, and then somehow that overwhelmed me, or saying I, being told I was faggot, or gay, or queer, because I was different, which, they were wrong, but it wasn't the right usage or terminology of it, you know, like, I liked women, but damn straight I'm weird, I like being different, fuck you guys. But at the time, you know, you're a kid, you want to be in with everyone, you want to be friends, you want to get to know people. 
you're fighting so hard to be friends with everybody and you want to enjoy them like everyone else is enjoying them like you see them enjoying each other but you're still just sitting back watching a screenplay and you have no idea how to get involved and then that wall that stump becomes a picket fence becomes a hedge becomes a wall becomes a mountain with time it's like it grows and the truth is it's like that with every me any mental disability the longer you avoid it the longer you don't acknowledge it and the more you succumb to it the bigger it becomes and the more power it has over you and then eventually you don't ever look up from the ground you never pull your nose out of your books you never try to say hi to people you get maybe a f yeah. out and it becomes so routine that even into your socially active adulthood you have some days where it's like that where just yeah and you gotta really fight through it and it's a battle I mean it's hard at first like at first you go how the fuck will I do this? No, stop. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what's going on in my life. So stop telling me that I can get better because it's not going to get better. It's never going to get better. And you know, it's true. It's really true. It's never going to get better. Especially as long as you have that mentality. And, you know, I had a time in my life where it really did get worse. My, I lived with my dad and my stepmother because I felt like I was hell with my mom. I was constantly told like that I was a defective product, that my genes were fucking wacko, and that's why nobody wanted to babysit me and watch me because I was a fucking issue child with problems and nobody could handle my ass and I was always making my mom cry and scaring off babysitters and that I had bipolar issues and manic depression and this whole list of stuff because they never really knew what the problem was <clears throat> and I had to be medicated for it constantly. I was even offered to apparently skip a few grades or something like that or because everything but my social aspects was ahead of the game. Which, could you imagine how awesome that would have been? If I didn't have fucking psychotic amounts of anxiety and depression holding me back in life. And that's really how it is too. Even in adulthood. And I lived with my dad and my stepmom though, you know. Because my dad was like, dude, you don't need drugs to fix your problem. You know, we all have problems. But I want you to make your choice and decide whether you want to. And I think maybe it's because a few times in my youth. In this place we call Stretch Mark Strip. We used to live, well, people call it that because it's a disability zone. Um, I think my dad caught me a few times really out of the loop because of my medication. As in, I would walk outside, I'd come upstairs and go back in because my throat would clench up, my stomach would get dizzy, <gasps> my head would feel weird, I'd, my stomach felt like I was doing hula hoops around my ass, and then there'd be boxes in the way. So I'd walk up to the third floor and walk back down, and there'd be boxes in the way. Like... And no matter which way I went, it just, I couldn't get to the door of the house. I think my dad might have caught on to something because the weird stomach aches I was telling to the doctors I now found out is like the same things people experience when they're hallucinating or they're too high or they're overdosed. And anyway, he never wanted me on medicine. You know, he didn't want me to be about that life because we come from a family of people with serious addiction issues. Which, well, and uh, <clears throat> my stepmom, she was really loving, but she was not going to take my shit, like anyone, or like anyone else was, I should say, like everyone else was, you know, with them, my anxiety and my depression, well, my anxiety wasn't through the roof till I wanted blackout much, it wasn't as bad anymore, I had separation anxiety or something, but I don't remember, but, um, Apparently dogs help. And a stepmom that loves you but wants your ass to do chores. Like, tells you to do chores or you don't get shit. Helps. Um. And, you know, it was great because I had that family unit. But still, at school it was terrible. And I tried going back to my old school. 
in Iowa, but I it felt like it followed me. I got along with everyone. It was great. I would get up in the morning. I'd shoot out of bed. I'd be happy, but then people would start talking about the past, and I'd feel that, like, <laughs> gripping again. And, um, that's really how it works, is when you think you're over it, you're really not. And then... Where did I go? Oh yeah, hello. Hi, I'm back. Um, I had too many thoughts at once again. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I moved back with my dad and my stepmom because clearly my dysfunction wasn't functioning where I thought it would. And, uh, that was dandy, but then, well, there was more trouble in paradise than I thought it was because my dad and my stepmom ended up splitting up for a time. My father, he relapsed. And you think, well, you're a child growing up and you think that your situations are bad. And then you see your happy-go-lucky father, who you think could fight anything in the world. Your hero, your man, your motivation, your inspiration. You see him start spiraling, you know? First, he's not with your stepmom. And then, you notice, you know, he's working later, he's sleeping in later, he's coming home later. And you stop seeing them all together. And then one day... You find what is clearly a metal cigarette in the couch that you're fully aware is not a cigarette because at this time, amazingly, our health class gave a huge session on drugs and behavior of addicts when they start to relapse. So you're already on to what's going on. And you're given a talk about how it's needed because the extra income and sometimes people who buy need to know that you're kosher with it. So you do it with them, but... Addicts, if you have addictive behavior, you have a cop-out for any situation that explains why you're doing what you're doing besides you're addicted. Besides the fact that you got too many fucking demons up here for you to deal with. <clears throat> and, you know, I saw my dad go from the strong man to this stranger. Because he let everything get a hold of him and overwhelm him. And it killed me. I don't think any 13-year-old should have to go through that. From that to getting their ass kicked and bullying, stepping upgrade to constant physical violence and aggression because they can't buy from him. And he refuses to sell the miners. So you're constantly getting into raps and battles and people are fucking shoving you in the hallways, and you're trying to handle your shit, but at the same time, you see your dad can't handle his shit, so that's kind of making you lose your shit on the side, but you still know that's not your shit, so it's not entirely affecting your shit, but you're still kind of... And eventually, you know, I might... My, uh, response to all this was I gave him a month to clean up. Well, I think it was two and a half that finally passed before he realized he wasn't cleaning up. And so I moved with my stepmother, and I had signed a China petition. I turned him in. My mom, my real mom, was back to the state of Washington in maybe 24 hours or less after the letter went out that I wasn't going to be part of any family anymore. Apparently for 13-year-olds, it's a pretty drastic and bold move, but... Well, I went back home to Iowa... Um, <clears throat> social studies was pretty fun. I gotta hear about this new game where you gotta play in a house in a town. With, if you fast forward the clock, bugs moved onto your furniture and you gotta push them around and squish them and cobwebs flood the place and your town became overran and there's animals and one of my teachers, he really loved that game. And me, all I did every day just to take my mind off things was I drew Bionicle. Somewhere between a mix between Chrono Trigger and Bionicle. Constantly. Non stop. And I think I developed some new insight through that because, you know, I was constantly like the mask of courage and the mask of wisdom. 
and what aspects lie between the two, and I'd make this make them into one mask, but I'd ask myself, what does courage and wisdom make? What does hope and love make? You know, I'd just kind of mix them all together and figure, try to figure out, well, I slowly gained insight to how aspects overlap and emotional depth while well, half paying attention to my teachers, and that was all going well and dandy, but the social anxiety was still there. I still wanted to be, you know, in with the crowd, and I'd still do stupid shit, like, not as stupid, but I'd make jokes, or I'd make a fool of myself, in one way or another, like, I wouldn't lie. I like being the clown. I like getting a laugh out of everyone, regardless of how much it hurt my dignity to other people's perspectives. And, uh, but, boom, 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 the anxiety was still there, the, uh, depression slowly mounted, you know, I went to church regularly, I attended every sports game, and I was happy this one school we were going to, it was this nice, cute little Dutch community, and, uh, the Dutch like their churches, like, I think there was like five or six churches, and this was like a half horse town, like, it wasn't even a full horse town, or one horse town, it was like half or quarter, like, I think it was like three or four blocks wide by like eight blocks long, and, um, the Dutch definitely have their own look, they have their own appeal, they, own, they have their own way of life, no matter where you go, if it's a Dutch community, it's a Dutch community, no doubt, um, <laughs> But anyway, and through all these distractions and such, there was still that, <sighs> you know, meanwhile, I had apparently what they call a Superman complex. I did whatever I could to save the day, run to the danger, you know, take the highway through the danger zone, but no, I guess it was just the drive to want to make the world a better place and slowly learning to keep my suffering to myself, but at the same time try to stop other people's suffering and their pain. And then, uh, I didn't realize how much I was burying until my senior year when I moved back to Washington. And... I fell on my ass. You know, that hollow ground finally gave away, revealing how empty it was from all the issues I'd buried and how much they just ballooned and made that sinkhole bigger. And... <sighs> I fell in love. I knew if I moved to Washington, things would be different. I didn't think that I'd run into someone that I thought I was going to love forever. I didn't think that kind of romance of love existed. I thought it was just a small... <sighs> She's so beautiful. <sighs> oh, she thinks I'm socially awkward and weird. Fuck. Back away. Back away. Go sit in the corner at this dance club because that's all you really know how to do. If you dance on the floor, you have to interact with people. People might judge you for dancing with dancing with other people because they see the way you dance and they might think it's funny when out. Meanwhile, everyone else is dancing just as ridiculously. So I'm just gonna sit in the corner because I don't know how to react right now. <gasps> Woman! And, <laughs> I actually, I had really judged her at first, because she came walking in with this little red teddy bear. And I was like, that bitch has issues. Like, look at her carrying a teddy bear like that. Like, she looks like she's a child. Like, she still hasn't grown up or anything. And then, the first thing she did was give me a hug. And I was that... Go away. Fucking get off me. Don't touch me! Why are you stroking my back? They hug me. They, they, they hug me. Kind of person, you know? And every time people would give me a hug, I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, okay with it. It was cool. It was rad. And I found out her story later. A lot of her story. And she had truly good reason, and I had no reason to judge. And 
to my Superman complex. I wanted to make her life better. I didn't want her life to be the same hell that it was. And I guess you can say that's when it started to change for me. When I started to give up on my demons and truly grab the rungs of fate and hope and want for a better future, but at the time it wasn't for myself. It was for another person, which might be a good reason, but we'll talk about the self bit later. <clears throat> But, you don't really understand the struggle other people go through until the time you want to do anything you can and fight to make someone's life better, but you have to sit in the hallway outside their door because their demons get to them that badly, that their depression overwhelms them, and, well... It's not really my story to tell, but hoping every day that they don't do the worst, you know? That they don't go the distance and get where they want to go because they feel like they want to go there. And you constantly worry and struggle because of your, all these other things people say about them. And you don't want them to be that way. You don't want things to be that way. And that's the struggle for anybody who's on the outside looking in. And it is so weird when you're used to being the depressed person. And then you become the person on the outside, unable to get in. And having to claw your way through that shell every time. To hold them. To make them feel comfortable. And... You know... Sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes it truly takes a blitzkrieg to get through to some people. Other people maybe have to be more subtle, like, you know, like a meerkat or a tunnel worm or something. You know, you have to smoothly get your way in and then just snuggle up to them or something. But I think it's also a lot of the men mentality of what's going on with a lot of today, you know. People are, kids are constantly encouraged by television. Chase love. Love will save all. Love is the answer. They want that family. They want this. They want that. But they don't... They aren't ready for it. You know? Nobody's ready for everything that they want right away. And there's a whole life to live. And then the fact that you're not achieving everything you want just mounts and mounts against you and makes you feel... <sighs> and life's a journey. Sure, you're gonna die. We're all gonna die. But take it a step at a time. Enjoy the journey. Stop to smell the flowers. Sip on the chai tea. Smell and enjoy the yuzu dragon to the point you can taste it. You know, take those long walks on the beach where you can smell the algae, rotten fish, salty ocean smell. Depends on the day and the tide and the algae and the type of plankton. But live it. Love it, because there's so many small moments that you can, well, that you can look back on and wish they went differently, and at the same time that you don't realize you're taking for granted, because, you know, you're too busy locked up thinking about, well, thinking about whatever your demons are telling you to think about, thinking about, you know, things that are spurring your anxiety, your depression, who might leave, who might walk out, maybe even what do people think. What if you can't do this? What if you can't do that? You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't surmount anything. You can't rise. You can't fight. You can't do it. You're worthless. You're trash. You're pathetic. You're filth. You'll never amount to anything. Who cares about you? Who loves you? Nobody loves you. Everyone just pretends to love you. They wear a mask. They pretend to care about you. They pretend to be your friends. They pretend to want in. They're all lying. They're all pathetic liars. They're fakes. They're cowards. They're jerks. They're assholes. They're all the same kids that picked on you in high school. They're the friends that lured you to a trap to watch you get your ass kicked by other people. Those aren't friends. Everybody's the same person. They're all just like that. What's the point of living? You're alive and then you die. There's nothing in between. Who cares? It's just what's the point of existence? What's the point of life? It's all trash, over and over, things like that, constantly. And, 
again, a different friend had anxiety and depression really bad. And I worried about their life all the time. And this goes back to some of those stories that, you know, I, I don't think I really ever told anyone because I didn't want anyone else to hear. But they too, like the little bird that I fell in love with in high school, suffered. They were constantly taking things, whether it was medication or ibuprofen. Cutting themselves a little deeper every time. And you really don't know how deep their scars run emotionally. And nobody who isn't really fighting somebody else's depression, who isn't trying to fight for somebody else's life, can really understand that pain you get when you walk in on a random drop-in to say hi to a friend or to meet up for him, and there they are with their wrists slit open, and they're just, they're waiting for death to come to them. And you respect them too much to, for some reason, be a dumbass and call the hospital. And so you sit there, and you hold them. <sighs> Tying their wrists up with bandanas. Telling them everything will be fine. Telling them the lies that you... You know aren't true on the inside, but you want them to believe that it'll be okay, that it'll get better, that the life won't be this bleak. And on the inside, you keep hoping that the fight isn't the same fight you deal every time you walk in and see them like that. That you don't want them to die, and you know they want them to die. And so you do whatever it takes. You go great lengths. You even stretch yourself out to the extreme. And you never tell them about your demons. And no matter how much their demons might be similar to yours. Because you're afraid that that one little push might set them off. And then you'll come in. And that gash won't be a little slit. It won't be a little blood. It'll be a train track. And they'll be fucking gone. Like they eventually did. <sighs> and then you ask yourself, if I had just taken the fucking time to call the hospital to tell everyone how fucked up they were, would they still be here? <sighs> would they still be around to be, to be my friend? <sighs> would they still be around to be happy? Would they have that family that they wanted? Would they have that house they dreamed of? Would they cruise in the yacht on the ocean? That they always imagined and talked about when they weren't at their low, when they were hopping on top of rocks and talking about how they're going to conquer the world? Would they have everything that they wanted if you had the strength to betray their friendship for even a moment? And you know what? Learning what I've learned now, being who I am now, I would have picked up that phone. I would have called. I would have had them go to any sanitarium. I would have had them go to any hospital. I would have had them go anywhere. Anywhere but in the ground. Because they deserved to fly. They deserved to live out their dreams. You do... Too. Anyone watching this who might be feeling that, that's what you deserve. You don't deserve to be Earth. You don't deserve to die. You don't need to end your life. You don't need to go away. You don't need to fade. You don't need to disappear. You might not think that your life is precious. You might not think that your dreams mean anything to anyone, but they do. They do. And there are people who want a dream out there 
their lives because of health, because of some weird defect, they're ending slower and slower every day. And they succumb to it. They fight. Some of them give up. A lot of them, I see them trying to smile every fucking day. And you should too. <sighs> because everyone is precious. Because life is beautiful. There's a whole fucking world out there of beautiful. There's people. Sure. They'll walk away. But many people are beautiful. And you just gotta take the time to get to know them. To know what they're going through and their struggles. There's a grove to chill at, to relax, to get away. That's, that's fucking gorgeous to me. There are rivers with water running through them and life teeming in them. And deer. And so many people just drive by them and don't even notice how beautiful that is. There's cities. Older than your family probably ever will be. Well, technically not true, but your current family can even fathom or remember. That you can still see to this day. And that, even in itself, the painting, that old artwork, that is beautiful. And it's all worth seeing. And it's worth fighting. And after I lost that friend, I didn't want it to do that. I mean, when I was younger, you know, I wanted it. I really did. I, I didn't want to be here anymore. But, <laughs> ironically, it was my vindictiveness that caused me to not cave. And, uh, I didn't want to be that depressed person anymore. I didn't want to give up anymore. I didn't want to fight anymore. Well, with myself, I guess you could say. I wanted to be happy. And, you know, that's what it takes. It takes... It doesn't take something dramatic, but it takes that desire to want to grow, to want to thrive. To stop living in an icy hellhole. And let your flames th shine through. To let that spark begin. To let it burn and make your soul fucking rise. To set your world on fire. To give way for something even more beautiful. To show everyone that you're a fucking sun. That you're bright and gorgeous. And they should look at you. They should acknowledge your presence. That they should accept and respect the fact that you might not be a red dwarf. You might not be a gas giant. You could be a centaur. But it doesn't matter. Because for all you could care, you're fucking Alpha Centauri. And you shine beautiful enough. And no two stars shine the same either. Just like no two people are the same. Everybody has their flaws, which makes them beautiful. It makes their strengths that much more noticeable. And in people who can pave over their flaws, who can just work with their weaknesses and deal with it, those are the people that everyone really, really gets jealous of. Even the perfect people aspire to be that way. And it takes accepting yourself to move forward. It takes learning to love yourself. To look in that mirror and see that despicable, disgusting sack of shit. That piece of filth that you don't even like acknowledging. That person that you walk into the bathroom and you try to avoid seeing. It takes learning to tell that person that you love them. To telling them that they're beautiful. That's where it begins. With accepting and loving yourself. For looking at your scars and saying, Nobody has these. Nobody but you wears this mantle. And that's what it takes to start getting better. It'll always be there, you know. There's no such thing as living a life entirely depression for you'll have some down days. There's no way to be entirely free of anxiety because chemical centers, but working on staying optimistic and bright, that's the way to go. And from there, you know, who knows? You might even run into some socially awkward friends along the way. People are like, hey, you're socially awkward. Come hang out with me. And you'll be like, the fuck? No, I'm socially awkward. Why are you? How do you know? And then you find that they're socially awkward. And then it becomes cool because you're awkward together. 
And then you like secondly you have a whole troop of awkward friends. <laughs> one by one, gathering the awkwardness. But that's what it's about. It's not about trying to fit in with people. It's not about who accepts you for you. It's not about who tells you what to enjoy. It's about doing what you want. It's about living your dreams. It's about being with people who are as weird as you are. Doing things that you're comfortable with. Things that make you happy. That's how you overcome your demons. Or dancing with them, you know. But some people, they just want to watch the world burn. And, uh... Some of my friends are crazy like that too, but, you know... That's what makes them weird also. Whether you're a class clown, whether you're a psychopathic clown, whether you're a sailor killer clown, whether you're an astute clown, whether you're a sad clown or a happy clown, just clown around and enjoy life. Because you ever, never know when it's gone. You never know when a friend is gone. And you'll never know when you lose a loved one. You'll never know when a family member's gone. And for those of you out there who have, I'm sorry about your friends and your family's losses. Nobody really deserves loss. But loss is something that we all deal with. It's a pain and an emotion that we all have. We all lose loved ones. Some sooner than they should have. Sooner than others. Others, fortunately, go on forever, it seems like. Like, they're energized batteries. But, I just hope that you realize. I hope you feel that. I hope you find that in you. I really hope you don't have to struggle. And I really hope... I don't want to say... You become aware of the struggle you put the people around you through because that might make you feel worse. But you're not alone. And other people see you struggling and they care. And they fight just as much for you as they would for anyone else. If not more for you. If they, the more they care about you, the more they're going to fight for you. That's just how it goes. And all it takes is stepping forward. You know, if you care about somebody... Let them know. If you love somebody, love them. Don't don't run because you're afraid of love. You're afraid of affection. You know, care about them. Let them know that you care because that's all it takes is a caring hand. Something there, a gentle, loving reminder that you're worth something. Sometimes they'll go crazy and develop weird, mad crushes over them. And then they're like, I don't know what to do. Other times you won't go crazy. But, other times you're like, oh my god, that's a huge centipede. No. Um, <laughs> other times you're like, okay, this is a cool friend. We're friends, it's great. And sometimes you're just crazy in love together. But, there's a journey there. You know, I don't know if you've seen a board of Monopoly or Candy Land. Sorry, shoots and ladders. I had one in mind. Life. There's a whole board there. There's whole steps. Don't stop just because you the small shoot at the beginning. Don't throw away the board. Don't turn back. Don't quit your journey because it seems impossible. Fight on. Live on. Because you'll find that sometimes the impossible journeys are the ones worth most worth having. That adventure is everywhere. It's truly, it's truly a pound. And you just gotta take the chance on it. You gotta put that step out there. And you gotta find the courage in yourself to enjoy it. And thank you guys for watching this. I know it's long. I know it was a little hectic. I know it was a little emotional and bumpy. But I'm glad I could share this story with you. Tales Night. Over and out.